showed you Ricky Martin's picture last week. Are we all good? We A OK, Katie? OK, it doesn't look like we're having much uh, user participation in our first live poll we're doing in class right now. Maybe you just haven't looked on the screen. That's cool, too. Class hasn't officially started until right this second. So if you'd like to vote on what we lecture about today, on the spot, live, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, and the way you do it, if you can't read it, I can barely read it and I'm in front of it, is you can, using your cell phone, text one of these words, either World 8, Econ 8, or China 8, to the number 37607. You can also tweet it or submit a keyword to that HTTP pollev.com. Can everybody, does everybody understand what I'm saying? How many people have actually done this? Actually done, oh, I try, I can see it. So there's 252, now 265 of you have done it. So it actually instant update as we go. Uh, so, so far, again, for those of you that are about halfway in the room and back, maybe you can't read it. But if you want to have the rest of the world leaders lecture that we were halfway through last week, you text world eight. If you like to jump straight to World Economic Lecture, you can do Econ 8. And if for whatever reason you'd like to jump to China and just start lecturing about China, rich, then you can do China 8 or maybe rich 8. No, just China 8. Text it to that. So we'll have a one more minute. Why is it China? Oh, she just had to pick a number. The way that the Politburo works, you have to have a unique, new, a unique keyword and so China was already taken and China 1 was already taken so she bumped it up to China 8. Okay so class is beginning if everybody could bring it down a notch, tone it down, tone it down, finish up your side conversations if you could be so kind. Do we have any questions about anything? What's that? How is the exam working tonight? Is everybody interested in that? I think it's going to work beautifully. Did you have something more specific? All right, for everybody in the room right now, please listen up. Again, this is class. This is college, so chill it out. Uh, what we're going to do is have our lecture, our regular class lecture that you wait with bated breath for every week for this exact moment to kick off so you can have a lecture. And then at 9 o'clock, and maybe we'll actually wrap up lecture a little bit early for this transition. You don't have to move. You can continue to chill and sit where you are. And we'll have a team of people that pass out Scantrons. And at 9.01, both screens will flip over to a visual exam. So a slide will come up, question one, answer the question. We'll go to question two, answer the question. Is that cool with everybody? Again, we can, I'll go over the directions again right before it starts in two hours. But for anybody that's already panicking, just relax, chill. It's 25 questions. It's multiple choice. It's all on screen. One slide will go very quick. One side, one screen will go very quickly for people that answer fast. The other slide, other slideshow will go more chill, relax. For those that need more time to contemplate. And they'll just sit in here and loop for half an hour. Many of you will finish in five minutes. Some of you would be here when the sun comes up at dawn, still trying to figure out one of the answers. But we won't let you do that. You only have a half hour to take it. If uh, you don't see very good in this class, well, me personally, I can't see anything halfway through this classroom, feel free already, like right now, to come up towards the front. If you, if you have any problems, you're in the back of the room right now and you have any problems reading the stuff on screen, you should probably go ahead and move forward now. And you can do that, you, you don't have to do it right this second. You can do it as I'm lecturing. But there's plenty of seats here in the front of the room, so go ahead and do it now because there will be people rolling in at about 9 o'clock. Some people are watching this live online and they will show up uh, about 9 o'clock. So go ahead and grab the seats you want now to get the best view of the screens. Uh, if you have any issues with that. Okay? Cool. Any other questions about anything class related? 
Any class dynamical stuff? Okay. Well, it looks like uh, 500 people have voted. And I suppose that's a fair representative. That's a fifth of the class. 20% of the class has decided that we'll be lect lecturing about the rest of the world leaders. Is that cool with everybody? Round of applause. Is that cool with everybody who didn't even vote? OK. Then Katie, if you want to go ahead and swap it over to our lecture, we'll get that going now. Are you ready to let the learning begin? Yeah! How's everybody doing anyway? Pretty good? You loving the fall weather? Yeah, it's feeling good. Football season, best time of the year here in Blacksburg. Uh, and now I'll start with some quick announcements again. We got a lot of chatter going on in the room. Please keep this in mind. Please keep this in mind for all those talking. Maybe shut up for just one second and listen to this. If at any time you are asked to leave this room by a teaching assistant or one of the security people, you must leave the room for being disruptive. And you also have to show your ID and get a 50 point deduction on your grade. So I'm not trying to make people scared and sit in utter silence because they're petrified. But do keep in mind with this many people, if half of you are chatting with your neighbor, then it's a din of noise. And you're disrupting not me, because I'm really loud and obnoxious, but you're disrupting the other people around you who are here to listen to lectures. Is that cool? 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 All right. Quick announcements today. Uh, it's the first time I've done announcements all semester, isn't it? Uh, everybody keeping up with their quizzes? Let me hear a shout out for everybody that has done all the weekly quizzes so far. Yeah! <laughs> Makes me feel good inside. I like that, like a hot pocket. Uh, keep up on that and lock down those 400 points for the semester. Keep on it, everybody's doing good so far. I have completely failed to mention, and maybe some of you picked this up on the course calendar, there is no class next week, no live lecture next week. <laughs> Everybody is cheering for no live lecture. How do you think that makes me feel, all right? Now I've lost my hot pocket love. Um, there, are, there will be actually several Wednesdays throughout the semester. We don't have live lecture because other events do happen in this room, and sometimes they happen on Wednesdays. So it just so happens to be a Wednesday we can't have class. But I don't want to rip you off. You paid your tuition. You've paid for your class. So instead of live lecture next week, how about a pre-recorded lecture online? Someone's saying, no, I want nothing. Give me nothing for my money. I pay for this class. Cancel the whole semester. Uh, Pre-recorded lecture with at least three flash quizzes attached to it. All worth points. 10, 15, 20 points each. Something like that sound good to everybody? Then yeah. we shall do it. It shall be done. And it'll all be exam material because what else is happening next week? Our midterm. I know. How could it possibly be time for a freaking midterm already? It's on the schedule. I guess it's happening. So here's the deal. Everything we've talked about in class thus far, that's exam material. Any videos on pre-recorded lectures I've assigned you thus far for flash quizzes, that's all exam material too. As will the pre-recorded lectures that you'll watch over the weekend, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And that you'll be taking flash quizzes on that as well. So how is this sounding? Is this sounding pretty good that I'm going to give you some, some lectures to watch, then a flash quiz that you can earn points on that, and actually that's reinforcing material that you might see again on the midterm on Thursday. Is that going to be cool with everybody? Yeah. So you get, it, you get a little bit of points here and here and here and then again on the midterm on Thursday. All of it's reinforcing itself, I hope. Okay? Is everybody hip to that? Any questions about any of this stuff? Because it is a lot to, uh, to pile on you in one week. Uh, we have only a Saturday morning film this week that I know some people are having problems getting tickets, so I'm going to try to have more movies. Trust me, I'm working hard behind the scenes. We're trying to do more. There is a Monday night event. It's not a film. 
It's actually a live event that we will have a section of tickets reserved for, probably only a couple hundred. But you're going to have to earn it, and please only do this if you're interested in it. Don't do it just for points. But it's a taping of a podcast show called Democracy Now. Has anybody ever heard of Democracy Now? Yeah, is it on TV too? I have no idea. So they're going to be here, and we're helping the, the, the uh, crew of people set up in McBride 100 for that on Monday night. So we'll have some tickets reserved for that. And again, let me repeat. Please do not go to this event just to grab a few points. It's not worth it. Only go if you're interested because it is going to be a hour-long conversation. I think it's about gun control and gun issues in the United States. And then there will be a Q&A afterwards that will last another hour or so. So this is not for the weak of heart. This is, one, this is something you go to if you're interested in it. Don't go to grab 20 points. It's not worth it to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, too. I'm going to send it to everybody. Yeah, the, we're, we're, helping, we're helping set it up for them. Yeah. What are the hours for the midterm? That's a great question. I don't really work, so I don't know the answers to these questions. Any ideas? There will be two different opportunities uh, that you'll have to take the midterm exam, and you will have to sign up for one, and it'll be 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. on Thursday. Next Thursday, not tomorrow. Next Thursday. By the way, do you have to take the exam? Oh, are you going to take the exam? Yeah. It's online. It's online. It'll be challenging, to be sure, but I know you've been learning and you're going to do well on it, so you'll take it and it'll be good. Yes. I'm sorry, I had a question down here first. Yes. Why can't we have the movies in Burris? Because actually it's very hard to book Burris because there's events happening and also it costs money. It actually costs a lot of money and you have to have security and stuff as you've seen. So uh, I will try, you know what, I will try by the end of the semester to have maybe one or two. I'll see about their schedule to see if we can have one or two movies in here. But actually it's just not that much fun either. You see the screens, it's not that much, they're, they're not, not a very big picture and it's kind of hot and stuffy in here and it costs money and it's a pain in the ass. But I will continue to find new ways to offer you new opportunities, including, I'm glad you brought that up and I've not heard, forgotten your question there. Would anybody be interested, how hardcore are you into this class, if I started setting up Wednesday night, late night film night? Really? Really? You guys are all insane. Uh, I, do, I, I do have access to McBride 100 where we have the Monday night movies and so I can probably get in there some Wednesday nights too, but it would be after class. So it'll be after, it'll, probably, it'll be 9.30 at the earliest and maybe 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock film, you cut, yeah, 10 o'clock Wednesday night. Ah! You're all insane. All right, I will, again, in an effort in an effort to do everything I can to provide opportunities for you, I'll start working on that as well. Uh, now I've got your question, yes. Is the midterm open book? No. The midterm is your brain only, just like tonight's world, re, uh, world leaders visual. It's your brain only. No notes, no friends, no phone a friend, no 50-50, although that'd be fun to do 50-50. How cool would that be if you took an exam and it was like five or six multiple choice options worth 10 points each question and you could 50-50 it for half the points? Would you do that? If you're like taking a test and you're like, God, I don't know the answer to this. This question's worth 10 points. Take away half those options. And now I've only got three options and now the, the question's only worth five points. Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud because that's the kind of thing I do when I'm lecturing. Yes. No, no, the midterm's online. You can take it in Zimbabwe if you want. It's all good with me, although their internet connection's probably sketch. So um, I would highly advise, and I'll send out an email reinforcing all this, but I think most of you just delete my emails. Good for you. Uh, I, if, if it was me, I would take it somewhere on campus. Because you can't never go wrong if you're inside the network. Things can go wrong if you're outside the network. Yes? The midterm is timed. Hmm? Yep, yep, okay. Uh, I, it's all in the syllabus somewhere. That's why I wrote it. You took a test on it. Okay. 
Uh, so let's see. This Saturday film is booked. Monday night event we have not sent out tickets for yet. We will send an email when we put that up. And then the next film is next Saturday because we're out of commission next week for this room. And we'll work on the Wednesday night, a late night films. Okay, any questions about anything else? Questions, comments, concerns about your world regional class? Going once, twice? Sold, let's get to lecture now. What's going on in the news, my friends? China, Taiwan, protests, Taiwan, China, Japan, protest. Yes? Uh, an aircraft carrier, I hear something about austerity measures where? In Spain, anything else? There's a UN meeting. Every world leader is currently in the greater New York City area right this second. As I always offer every semester, a big UN meeting happens. If anyone, anyone gets in their car tonight after class, drive straight to New York City and can somehow manage to get a photo bomb opportunity with a world leader, 50 points. Let's make it 150 points. If right, starting right now, you can get a picture with your arm around a current president or prime minister. 150 points. They have to be alive too. You can't kill them and then do it, all right? That's a non-starter. Don't assassinate no one. Don't do that. An A in this class is not worth life in prison. Well, I don't know. It's a pretty good class, all right? Any other current events? Okay, let's get to some. I heard all the ones that I wanted to hear and maybe a whole bunch more, but here's the stuff that I want you to know starting about now. Whoops, let me go back. Did anybody hear about the big water fight yesterday? Water fight! Woo! You cannot make this shit up. An international water fight occurred yesterday. Who were the combatants in the international water fight? Japan, China, and actually Taiwan has now entered the fray over this in Kaku Island. Sorry for my Chinese friends, the Ayu Islands. Uh, the center of this international spat that we began talking about last week, it is getting hotter. Like way hot, like so hot we should put some water on it. That's why they had a water fight. Now what exactly am I talking about? 50 Taiwanese fishing vessels decided to go for an excursion around that handful of damn rocks just off the coast of China and actually just north of Taiwan. 50 Taiwanese fishing vessels said, hey, we're all going to go fishing and we hear the fishing's great right here at these rocks. It's an obvious, obvious move to inflame the tensions around this particular international issue. And so when they showed up, Japanese Coast Guard vessels have already been patrolling this island, and they started shooting water cannons at the fishing vessels, and then the fishing vessels started shooting water cannons back at them, and then the Chinese, who were probably watching and laughing at this point, joined in and started shooting their water cannons too. <laughs> you cannot make it up. So. Three, well, two sovereign states in a somewhat nebulous territory called Taiwan in an international water fight that may end in a declared war between two countries. This is how hot it's getting. I would have never six months ago said it would ever have gotten to this level of silliness before people start shooting at each other, but they got Asian style going on over there. They do it their way. Water fight first, then we kill you, all right? I saw a hand up, yes? You know what's, <laughs> I don't know why Taiwanese vessels would have water guns. I don't know why anybody would have water guns. Well, I take that back. The Coast Guard would have water guns because one of the uh, missions of any Coast Guard, including the United States Coast Guard, is putting out chip fires. Putting it, so if you were, or putting out oil spill fires. So it's logical that a, a Coast Guard vessel would have that type of capability. Fishing vessels, I have no idea. Maybe they shoot the fish out of the water with a water cannon. I don't know how they fish in Taiwan. 
Uh, anyway, here's the interesting part. You ready to jot down the interesting part? Well, it's all interesting, and it all may end up in war. The interesting part is, what the hell is Taiwan doing wading into this mess? And that, this is the most fascinating part. Every time I think this situation can't get more interesting and bizarre, it does. And I think something fascinating is going on behind the scenes here that's actually kind of positive. Does anybody know what I might be alluding to? Yes. Okay, someone's suggesting that maybe Taiwan is doing this stunt as a way to get sovereignty for themselves. I, that's good thinking, good critical thinking, but I think not. Yes? China, of course, considers Taiwan part of their sovereign territory. Now I think we're getting somewhere. So what happens? Yes? It, the, yeah, you got it, you got it. I love this freaking class. I love this class. Someone said this looks like, is, there, is this, could this possibly be Chinese-Taiwanese cooperation? That's what you should write down. It is. This is some behind the scenes cooperation happening between these two entities that we have been thinking for a long time. The, there, there might be a war between them, right? Maybe Taiwan's going to declare independence. Maybe China will attack them and take them over physically. Who knows? This definitely looks like some behind-the-scenes cooperation between China and Taiwan. And that's what I was getting ready to say before you so rudely interrupted with the exact right answer. What will happen if Japan fires on a Taiwanese ship? It's tricky. It's tricky, isn't it? But if Japan were to sink a Taiwanese fishing vessel, here's what I think is going to happen. I think China's going to swoop in and say, we consider Taiwan part of our territory. They're our brothers in arms. And now we have every right to blow that Japanese ship straight to hell. And they'll do that. And maybe you'll have some behind the scenes hugging between Chinese and Taiwanese people. OK, that's pushing it a bit far. But it looks like that's what might be happening. Taiwan is definitely, let me repeat this, definitely backing China's play here. Taiwan is backing the Chinese play for these islands. Because nobody in their right mind thinks that Taiwan is going to end up with them. So they are basically supporting the Chinese claim on these islands, and that's cooperation. I'm sorry, I saw a hand. Yes? Uh, it's, well, uh, it's, there is a Japanese Coast Guard that is separate from the Japanese Self-Defense Force. The United States Coast Guard is its own division as well. They're part of the armed services, but they're, they, they fall under the Department of Transportation, not the tar Department of Defense, so it's a very similar relationship. Yeah? Why is Japan Coast Guard written in English? Why is Japan Coast Guard written in English? Damn, that's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe so that whenever a U.S. ship shows up to help, they know who not to blow up. I, that's what I would say. That's a great, great question. I don't. I love this class. Yes. I'm sorry. Did the Taiwanese? I, don't, I have no idea if the Taiwanese got the water cannons from China. Who knows? Where do you pick up a, you know, a water cannon? I don't know. We should get one for class. Should we get a water cannon for class? I got blasted. That'd be awesome. Yes. That, uh, his uh, great, uh, someone's cr thinking critically up here too, saying, well, another possibility is that maybe Taiwan's just trying to stir the pot to start a fight between China and Japan. That could be, but either way, they're supporting the Chinese play. Yeah. What if Taiwan was forced into this by China? Don't think so. Don't, don't think so. Uh, uh, it, even though China claims to possess Taiwan, basically, China does not have boots on the ground. In other words, there's no Chinese soldiers in Taiwan. 
There's, uh, uh, there's no real leverage the Chinese government can have over Taiwan to make them do something. Yeah? Uh, see, that's what I'm suggesting I want you to be thinking about, because this class is so damn smart. If a, if a war breaks out, it looks like Taiwan is going to back China's play on this, which I'm saying that it, maybe they're in there instigating, basically to get it started, to say, hey, big brother China, look, see, we got your back, so you should take care of us now, right? We're all, we're all brothers so, and sisters, so yeah, we should have a nicer relationship, and you shouldn't try to invade us by force. Yeah? I think it, the islands, I believe, are closest to the Chinese coast, but pretty, pretty about the same distance to the Taiwanese coast. So I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. They're nowhere near Japan. That, of that we can all agree. Okay? Great questions, awesome questions. Uh, but the story's not done yet. I know you're riveted. You're riveted of the water cannon play. It actually gets a little more serious, okay? Uh, earlier today at the United Nations. Does anybody know who this guy is? Yoda, Prime Minister of Japan. Uh, Prime Minister of Japan said publicly, Japan will not compromise with China on claimed islands. So the leader of Japan publicly said, we don't give a damn. We will not cede this territory. We will not back down. Period. Explanation point, okay? Japan will never budge on its sacred ownership claim to this group of rocks, says the Prime Minister, uh, doing little to ease the tension with Asia's top economic power. So again, what we have in play now is everybody saying, it's ours and we're not going to back down. That's how wars start. There's not a lot of room for negotiations right now because everybody's screaming, it's mine and we're not going to negotiate. Uh, let's make it even more serious. This is a great political cartoon that sums up why you should be concerned as a US citizen. China simultaneously re released their story uh, saying China's resolve to safeguard sovereignty will never, ever change. Who's the number one fan of sovereignty? Rich, see, I got to do it that time. <laughs> That was delightful. Um, I didn't say anything. Uh, China has come out and said, we, will do, we think the islands are ours, and we are a sovereign state, and therefore our sovereignty lies on top of these islands, and we will not budge. Period. Explanation point. So both sides have solidified their position that they are ready to fight. This screen's a little off, Kate. I don't know if you can adjust the screen at all. Uh, over the Dayu slash Senkaku Islands, China has reiterated its firm will to safeguard sovereignty. Uh, at the same time that I've now pointed out that the Japanese Prime Minister was giving a speech at the United Nations General Assembly, which he said, we are not backing down either. Now, why should you as a US citizen give a damn about this story about a group of rocks near the coast of China? Well, we have interest in both parties. You can take the nicey-nice stance and say, well, we don't want anybody to fight. And if these two countries go to war, it's going to hurt everybody economically. But let's make it more real than that. That's just the nicey-nice version. Why else is this particularly important? Yes. We have U.S. troops in Japan. Japan is a gigantic, strong ally and friend of the United States. Can you envision anything happening in the future where Japan, someone declares war on Japan, what is the United States going to do? They ha we almost have to help. Now whether we declare war on China, let's pretend they declare war on each other. I don't know that the US would declare war on China in order to help Japan, but we're definitely going to help Japan. And you're, we're definitely going to send troops and ships, okay? Because if these two get into a fight, there could accidentally be U.S. troops involved by the mere fact that they're located 
several hundred miles away in Okinawa. So this is now a U.S. issue, like it or not, and that's what the political cartoon is showing you here, is Uncle Sam unwillingly has his foot wrapped around the boat anchor line there, and get, we're getting drug into this. Does the U.S. want to get drug into this? No, but there's not a lot of choice, perhaps, at this juncture. Yes? Yes, Japan is completely formally demilitarized. We talked about this already. Let's talk about it again. They don't have an offensive military. They only have a self-defense force. And they are saying, dig it. This is why we had this long, drawn-out talk about sovereignty. Japan says, these islands are ours. We're a sovereign state. We have sovereignty on these islands. In that situation, if these islands are attacked, Japan can say, Japan is being attacked. Japan is being attacked. Therefore, our self-defense force can defend the Sukuka Islands. Period. Explanation point. And now China has said, nope, we have sovereignty over these islands. And we will fight for them. So that's why this is spiraling into a very bizarrely dangerous situation. Sorry to have beaten this to death because you guys made me talk about it all last week, and now it's gotten crazier this week. Yeah. How do you, you can't attack the islands, but obviously it will be a naval, naval battle with all these ships in close quarters. And for those of you that have never been on a boat, never been on a ship, never been on a vessel in open ocean, they don't turn on a dime, is the phrase. The bigger the ship, the harder it is to maneuver and move around. And they don't move quickly. That's why naval battles are like slow motion fighting, because ships are just like, eh. oh, somebody's trying to attack us, okay. Eh. Okay, shoot, shoot, oh no, they moved. Eh. Where are they at now? Oh, yeah, they're there. Oh. It's great fun, not. It's like watching golf, all right? <laughs> so, the reason I'm pointing this out, and I want you to put it down in your brain, land wars are real straightforward. There's your enemy, here you are, you have a rocket, you shoot at them, you shoot bullets at them, you move this way, they see you, move that way, they see you, move a tank, you can see it. With ships in this now disputed area of water, you have all these ships that are floating around, and they're, they, they can't just stop, they're moving, and they're shooting water cannons at each other. And you guys think I'm being funny here or joking. I, I, I assure you I'm not. This is how wars start when people are shooting water at each other to make a political point, and suddenly they bump. And suddenly you bump. Oh, oh, now you just scuffed my car. And now we're going to bump back, and now, we're, now I'm going to shoot, and this is why this sea nonsense is much more dangerous than people just standing on land saying, no, this is ours, and we may shoot you if you come here. You understand what I'm saying? Right, this isn't like a car wreck. It's like a floating demolition derby waiting to happen. And you can't stop a ship on a dime. So it's pr very problematic. Uh, anyway, sorry, let me get to one more thing. In a total coincidence, in a total coincidence, do you believe in coincidences? I don't believe in coincidences. In a total coincidence, today, write it down in your notes, China launched its first aircraft carrier. Anchors away, and go kill Japanese people, all right? This is getting dangerous. They've had this aircraft carrier for a couple years. I've been reporting on this class, in this class for a couple years. They commissioned it, they've been built, uh, they had to rebuild it. They officially launched it, or not officially, they sent it out to sea about eight to nine months ago for test trials, and then it comes back into port and they fix stuff that didn't work. Today, they pick two day to officially bring in the brass, bring in the presidents and prime ministers of the country, and crack a bottle of champagne on this sucker and launch it. China's first official aircraft carrier is in the water as of this afternoon, 100% ready to do business. Coincidence? I don't think so. 
Okay? Don't think so. Yes? Why? A great question. Uh, why are they just now fighting over these islands? Anybody have an answer? Yeah? Be because now they can. Because now they can. Uh, what's that? Yes, well, both sides have been ramping up the rhetoric. But the, the quick question, uh, the quick answer is China was not equipped to do any sort of fighting with Japan for most of the last 60 years. Hell, for the most of the last 100 years. China is back. China is rich. China is powerful and it's ready to stake its claim on what it thinks it owns, and now it's ready to actually fight for it. Does that make sense? Hmm? What makes them worth fighting for? To prove your sovereignty, the all-important sovereignty, and to basically tell the world, don't mess around in our backyard. We are back, we are powerful, we are rich, and we're not playing around. I would say that the, one of the things that the top brass and the Chinese military are thinking about here is we must, we must have these islands at all costs. Because if we show weakness here, then Japan can have its ally, the United States, have warships floating around these islands, and that's 100% true. And that's something they cannot tolerate. And by the way, I'm not making fun of the uh, Chinese. Can you imagine a world where a Chinese warship is floating off the coast of Norfolk just hanging out? I can't imagine that either. So China, I think, is in a position of, we must do this. This is for our strategic interest in national security. We cannot have Japanese or U.S. ships hanging out a few hundred miles off our coast because of this damn little group of islands they claim is theirs. I can assure you the U.S. would be as equally pissed as China is if it, if it was reversed and these islands were off the coast of Norfolk and China claimed them. We probably would have blown the hell out of something already, knowing us. <laughs> we would have blown the hell out of it, then we would have given them money to rebuild it, and we would have blown the hell out of it again, and then rebuilt it again and sent them on their way. All right? Okay. Uh, you can't really see it here, but who's our main man here in the middle? That is who indeed. It's who uh, Gentile. And let's zoom in. There is the actual aircraft carrier. And there's our main man, who walking the red carpet earlier today on China's first aircraft carrier. Now, what the hell's so important about an aircraft carrier? It's a moving city, but it's not a city. We don't care about cities. It's a moving fortress, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine. It's a moving city of death. That's what it is. And someone said it's a projection of power. Write that down in your notes. An aircraft carrier is a projection of power projected where? Anywhere in the world. It's a projection of power to anywhere in the world. An army pretty much only protects your land. Even if you have a shallow water navy, you protect the waters around your land. An aircraft carrier is indeed a floating city that you can transport your troops, your jets, and your missiles to the other side of the planet and kill people there. And that is serious power. And only the big boys in the world have that projection of power. That's why China wants one, and that's why China has one. They are a big boy now. Yes? Absolutely, the United States uh, military establishment is not happy about this. Uh, but let me put everybody's mind at ease that it's suddenly worried that China's going to attack Los Angeles, which would be hilarious, all right? Uh, China now officially has how many aircraft carriers? One. One. How many does the U.S. have? Let me show you a quick graphic, okay? Here's China's awesome new aircraft carrier. Ah. Our awesome aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, all right, right there, ding, in red, all right? It's about the equivalent of the U.S. Uh, S. Nimitz. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than the Queen Elizabeth from Great Britain, which is getting ready to be decommissioned. <laughs> Sorry, Queen, take a nap. Uh, it's a few hundred feet larger than the Charles de Gaulle of France. They're one aircraft carrier. 
Uh, and the illustrious of Britons, I think, has already gone away in meeting the commission. But here's the world total for aircraft carriers. <laughs> if you can't read it, all of these are US. <laughs> so here's all the aircraft carriers in the world. And we'll put China's right here. It'll be cute. Here you go. The Liaonong goes right there. OK? Under the UK's four, actually it's down to three or two. And these two whole columns are all United States aircraft carriers. I know you, I've already told you this. If you didn't write it down already, write it down now. The US has more aircraft carriers than everyone else put together. So no one need lose any sleep just as yet about the imminent threat of the, of the Chinese Navy. Okay? Yes, and aircraft carriers typically go with escorts of ships and resupply ships and fuel ships. Uh, and China is working very hard to get up to that level. Let's make no bones about it. Maybe it will happen in your lifetime. China would very much like to match the United States, but they're a, they're a ways off from that just as yet. Yeah. How often does Thailand use its awesome aircraft carrier? I have no idea. I think maybe they use it for fishing. No, I'm just joking. I don't, any Thai people, I have no idea. I love your food. That's all I can say. Uh, a lot of these are actually going to be decommissioned and go away. All right? Most of this column is going away. Not those columns. Okay? They're not going anywhere. Cool? All right. Uh, now, let's get to some other current events I heard yelled out. And it's also reinforcing some things about world leaders that might pop up in a mere hour and 20 minutes on an exam. Uh, there is a huge UN meeting going on right now. Most world leaders are hanging out there, giving speeches and stuff. Did anybody see the awesomely hilarious Mumad Aminadjad from Iran give his talk earlier? Always a crowd pleaser. That Mumad, it's like stand-up comedy on crack. It's great. Uh, anyway, I did want to point out something that I think is um, kind of serious. Well, everything's kind of serious. But this is a rift that appears it's opening up on planet Earth that people have talked about in the past, but most of us have poo-pooed it. But it looks like it's coming, becoming real. And what I'm talking about here is there is starting to be a real rift between the West and Islam, the world of Islam, not just the religion, but all the countries that practice Islam, which is 1.5 billion people on planet Earth. And it's not just the Middle East. Most Middle Eastern countries are Islamic, but it also includes our friends in Turkey. It also includes our friends in Pakistan. There's 250 000, a million uh, Islamic people in India. Uh, most of Southeast Asia is uh, Islamic. Okay? So what I'm talking about is because of all of this rage and controversy around that Islamic uh, hate video that came out from the United States and all the protests that have been happening around the Middle East and abroad against U.S. embassies, including the death of a U.S. diplomat. A lot of us have been hopeful that it's just going to die down and things will settle out and everybody will chill. But it do, I do want to tell you, first time I'm ever saying this in front of a class of people, it looks like it's now starting to become a global phenomenon that will not go away peacefully and nicely. I'm not suggesting there's going to be any war between the West and Islam. I'm saying it's a rift. It's a rift between some countries that are friends now, but maybe are not going to be friends in the future because of this difference of culture. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this turning into something that nasty, but I did have to look at the UN news in the last 48 hours and say, well, this is really tangible now. Okay? The United Nations General Assembly meeting, which is intended to celebrate the world's common values, is this year exposing instead the gulf between the West and Islamic perspectives on freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and stuff like that. And these are things that aren't going to change. Okay? We in the West, Team West, we highly value freedom of expression. It's, what, it's part of our core. We, truly part of our ideology of who we are. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. That is part of our character. Worth fighting for. In Islamic countries, they say, that's cool. We mostly believe that too, except for stuff like this. 
that we say is religious hate speech. And we feel very strongly that that should be stopped. So what you have here is a true cultural division, a true cultural conflict that I'm suggesting to you, not to scare you and not to make you hate or want to hate or think about stuff like this in a negative context, but I want you to be aware of what's happening on the planet. This is not going to go away because both sides truly and passionately believe in their ideologies. And I respect everybody in all sides of this. That's why I want you to be aware of it. This is not something that everybody's going to get over and you guys will see it our way eventually. I don't think so. And I don't think so because folks like, who's that dude up there? Recep Erdogan. He is the Prime Minister of? There you go. Say it all with me. He's the Prime Minister of? You'll see him in the exam here in about an hour and ten minutes. And even Recep Erdogan, pro-Western, U.S. ally, leads a secular state. Even Recep, Recep got up in front of the U.N. today and said, this is a problem for us. This is a problem for us. Yes, U.S., we're your friends and allies. This is a problem for us. And you need to stop doing it. That's what made me think that, you know, this isn't just a bunch of crazy people who are protesting and doing wild stuff. This is a true cultural rift that's opening up. I hope we can bridge it, but it's opening up in a big way. It wasn't just uh, Recep who said this. Egyptian President Mohammed Mursi got up and said it, as did the firebrand Iranian President Mahmoud Aminadjad. Uh, and I will point him out so you can see his face too. He may or may not show up on the exam here in a little bit. Egyptian's President uh, Morsi got up and basically right after Erdogan got down and he got up and pretty much said the same thing, saying, hey, we respect you guys, but this has to stop. We're passionate about this and we're not going to change our minds. It's almost like the Japan-China fight over this damn group of rocks. Everybody is hardening their stance. I forgot to show a slide of this, but uh, U.S. President Barack Obama got up and spoke first and said, hey, look, dudes, we didn't do it. Uh, the United States government didn't put that video out, and we love you guys, and we don't want a, a, a cultural conflict, but we really believe in freedom of speech, and you just guys got to dig that. And then all of the Islamic leaders got up promptly and said, no, we don't dig that. We think you're cool, but we don't dig it. Yes. I, I don't know. I saw, uh, the question is, are, are all these countries getting or trying to get the United States to push for some sort of limitation on free speech when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, I, I don't know, and nobody does, including them. Everybody, it's just, everybody's talking about it right now, and more and more Islamic leaders are saying something needs to be done, but we don't know what, but something needs to be done. Yes. An insult to the Prophet Muhammad, this, this is why Westerners, including myself, this is why we don't get it. This is why we don't get it. Because we believe, we, our trump card is freedom of speech, and we say, you can say anything you want to about anybody you want to. You make fun of Jesus if you want to, we don't care. We believe, you know, we're, we believe what we want to believe about Jesus, and so you can make fun of him and burn him in effigy and do whatever you want to. You can burn Barack Obama in effigy. It's your freedom of speech, you can do anything you like, you can call him a Nazi if you want. That's us. That's the West. We say, whatever, we don't give a shit. Don't assume all cultures think that way because obviously they don't. And so what Islamic folks are saying is, we respect freedom of speech to a certain extent. And now we say our trump card is insulting the Prophet Muhammad is a no-go. Religion trumps freedom of speech in this case. So that's where the difference is. It's just two different cultures who more highly value one thing over the other. Okay? Sorry to be a, a Debbie Downer with all that great news about possibly this being a rift that's going to widen during your lifetime, get bigger during your lifetime, but it kind of looks like it is. Uh, and, of course, I already pointed out uh, the funniest, zaniest world leader of all time, uh, uh, Mamad Aminadjad, denounces uncivilized Zionist and urges a new world order and said the United States, of course, was the great evil empire or something to that effect. Oh, I'm sorry, Western powers in service of the devil. That's what it was. Not Satan, the devil. Uh, and then he went on to say that 
the rest of the world should just not pay attention to the United States and the West, and if the United States were just to disappear and go away, that all of the other peoples of the planet would all live in peace and harmony for the rest of mankind's time here. He's just one of those guys. You're like, dude, okay, we get it. You hate the United States, but was the world at peace and harmony prior to 1776 when we came around? I don't think the world was at harmony then either, dude, so maybe look into that. Uh, and some translations are saying that he once again suggested that Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth or off the map or something to that effect. So this is the last time that Mohamed Aminajad will be at the United Nations, so he was given in his gusto. He'll be out of office, I believe, this time next year. So he was given in his last great shot of, look at me, look at me, mommy, I'm a big kid, and pay attention to me, uh, so that it distracts you from the fact that I'm insane. Okay? Okay. So that's what Mamad did, uh, and another Mamad who was not so happy, and please do jot this down in your notes for possibly the midterm uh, exam, and even maybe the world leaders here in a little bit. All of this hoopla about the conflict over the Prophet Muhammad being dissed is mostly overshadowing this guy, and he has the sad face for a reason. Who's this guy? That's Muhammad Abbas. He is the leader of Palestine. Go ahead and write this down. He had aspirations of going to the United Nations General Assembly tomorrow and putting forth a resolution for the General Assembly to recognize the sovereignty of Palestine. Okay? So, would that pass, by the way? Would it pass the P5? No, who would veto that? The United States would veto it. He wasn't trying to take it to the P5, though. They're trying to take it to the General Assembly and get enough countries on the planet to basically go along with it, knowing full well that the United States would veto it anyway. Why would you do that? Basically to isolate the United States and Israel and say, look, everyone in the whole world wants us to be a state and those two countries are holding us up. It's all their fault. So isolate them. Uh, please go ahead and jot this down too. There's about 195, we say, 196 countries on the planet. Something like 120 or 130 or 140 of them will likely approve this. Just so you know. I think 130, about 130, 140 countries will probably say, sure, we recognize the sovereignty of Palestine. Not everyone, though, obviously not the U.S., not Israel. And who else on the Security Council, by the way, would also say, no, 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 we've got to stick with our friends, the U.S., on this one. Uh, China, no, China actually has already said yes. The British, the British are lapdogs. They'll say, no, 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 no. The U.S. says thumbs down, we say thumbs down too. But here's what I did want you to jot down. Both China and Russia have already pretty much said, we have no problem with this. We give that a thumbs up. Yes? We'll ha I'll have to hold the question on the Israeli-Palestinian situation until we explain it in full in a lecture. Uh, yes? Is there any possibility of the United States reversing this decision? Answer? Or, no, reversing their opinion? No. No way in hell. Not only would the U.S. never reverse its opinion on this, the U.S. has threatened in the past, if you even put this up for a vote, we're going to cut off financial aid to you. And we actually have, so. Uh, we will threaten anyone, as, economically threaten, any way we can to make sure that that vote does ne that never happens. If that makes sense, okay? So maybe a test question on the midterm. All of this hoopla going on right now at the United Nations is really overshadowing or, or casting a shadow over what was hopefully going to be a big deal for the Palestinians, and now it's back burner, okay? They may still put it forward tomorrow. I don't know. We'll see, all right? Okay, uh, and I didn't want to just have all Middle Eastern uh, leaders and UN stuff so to move to another part of the planet, and somebody actually mentioned this earlier, who's this guy? Oh, oh, oh this is Francois Hollande. Uh, and Francois Hollande, is he 
Is he center left or center right? Left, all right? And he is the one that's kind of bucking the trend in Europe. Most European leaders are center right conservative, fiscally conservative, all about austerity measures, right? Cutting budgets and trying to get their economies going by stopping spending and getting back on track with a balanced budget. Francois Hollande is the center, only center left guy in Europe left, I guess. And France has pretty much said, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to cut budgets because we like having all our social benefits and we like having the retirement age at, at 25. Uh, or is it 12? I don't know. Uh, and we want all our stuff, so we don't, we're not ready to take the pain yet of cutting a budget. And so what's happening right now is this guy just got elected to office six months ago. And he said, okay, here's what I'm going to do as a liberal left fiscal guy. Tax the rich. That's how we'll balance the budget. Tax the rich. Dig this. They're trying to pass a law right now. Go ahead and jot these numbers down. He, he wants, he's trying to pass a law that anyone who earns more than 1 million euros, 1.29 million US dollars, will pay a, a tax rate of 75%. <laughs> Rich people think they got a bad here. Try moving to France, all right? So you make $2 million, give 1.5 of it back to the French government. Cha-ching! All right! That's how some countries try to pay for social benefits and things like that, okay? Uh, what do conservative economists think is going to happen? All the rich people will do what? Leave and get the hell out of France, which they probably should have done years ago anyway, all right? So we'll see if this passes, but it's definitely, I'm bringing this up because it's definitely bucking the trend of every other country in Europe. A story that somebody brought up in the front row over here is that Spain is just now enacting austerity measures. Go ahead and jot that word down, austerity. And austerity measures are what I've referred to. Slashing budgets restructuring your welfare program so not as many benefits are going out, restructuring your health care, or just slashing budgets to schools and for infrastructure improvement, basically saving money. Austere, We're gonna get all austere on our people and slash budgets. That is the trend across Europe and Spain is getting ready to slash to the bone because they're so damn broke. The unemployment rate of people like you in Spain Dig this, your exact age bracket, your exact age bracket demographic, 55% unemployment in ages 18 to 25. Over half your people your age are unemployed. And they're just broke, everybody's broke. And so they're slashing everything to the bone in Spain. Jot this down too, they've already started to do that in the United Kingdom. David Cameron's United Kingdom has already started to slash stuff and people are feeling the pinch. And he's becoming less popular by the minute, perhaps, because of that. All right? Everybody dig? Sorry to bore you with European policy, but it's important stuff as well. Uh, but I believe we left off last week with this. Bam Bam is awesome. Uh, do we get this far in class? Of course, you're going to remember this the rest of your lives now. And I've got several sexual harassment lawsuits pending. All right, so we know our who, we know our chi, and we know ma. And of course, all three of these folks are now weighing in on the Japanese-Chinese dispute over this group of rocks. And to reinforce our opening story of the night, what opinion do you think President Ma has about who owns those islands? I'm thinking he thinks China owns those islands. Because 20 fishing vessels didn't just accidentally all float 200 miles north of Taiwan. They knew what was going on. Everybody knows what's going on here. Okay? So all three of these dudes probably got a good idea that maybe China owns those islands. Uh, do we get as far as these guys? Okay. That's uh, Mahmoud uh, Minutajad. We talked about him already, given the firebrand speech at the United Nations earlier. And, of course, Ayatollah Khomeini, who has ultimate authority in this country. Khomeini does, uh, and go ahead and uh, kind of maybe think about this. I don't even know if I want you to jot it down. 
It appears, it appears, for those people that pay attention to such things, that the Ayatollah and his clerical group have basically used Aminadjad as like a little attack dog, like a little chihuahua. <laughs> Seriously, okay? They wanted to consolidate as much power as they could in Iran, but they don't want to be the ones to go out in the street and do it because they're clerical, they're holy people. So the way they've done this over the course of the last five years is let their little attack dog go out and bark, 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 bark and pull everybody to the crazy, crazy, crazy right and spout this crazy right-wing shit to everybody and say, oh, Israel's going, we should kill everybody in Israel and the U.S. is the devil and this is all horrible and Islam is awesome and our state's the greatest and all the Arab leaders all suck. We are the greatest, we're Iran. And just they're holding on to his leash, like a little chihuahua. Just keep, yeah. And all of the world, and actually a lot of people in Iran, have been focused on that little chihuahua over there raging and barking as the whole system just slowly, behind the scenes, gets pulled a little bit more to the conservative right. See what I'm saying? I actually don't think that the Ayatollah and the group who are really in charge of Iran are as extreme as Aminadjad. They've just let him go out there and bark while they've consolidated power behind the scenes. And now they're reeling the chain in. And you're going to see that happen. All right, all right, Chihuahua, that's enough. Settle down. We've consolidated power. We've rallied the population enough around us and our nuclear program and other things. And so you can go sit down now, OK? So that's how these things are working politically, kind of a little puppet action behind the scenes in Iran. And as I suggested, go ahead and know his name for our semester and for the exams, because he's going to be around for another year, but his time is up. Mahmoud is in his second term, and I think he's out of office in another year, year and a half. Okay? So he'll be leaving soon. The big test to see what's going on in Iran is to see who replaces him. Will the society put another right-wing crazy person up there, little barking really loud, or will they try to be a little more moderate and put up a more liberal candidate or more centrist person. Okay? All right. Uh, and we said here's the proof in the pudding about who's really in charge here. Uh, and I think we already did know your Ayatollahs. We all know our Ayatollahs, yes? Okay. Well, did we already show Sean Connery in here too? So Ayatollah Khomeini, the original founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran back in 1979, dangerously looks like... <laughs> A aging Sean Connery. Uh, and what was we, what were we asking here? I think the question was who would be in the Arab League? Which person would be invited to the Arab League? And I pointed out that, oh, actually, many of these Arab leaders have now been deposed, and one possibly is getting deposed right now. That'd be Al Assad. Who would not be invited to the Arab League here? Back to a minute of Jod. He's Persian, not Arab. And I believe I lit up the Arab League to you said this is an ethnicity across most of the Middle East, kind of common ethnicity. Lots of folks that you know, even people like uh, uh, extremist Osama bin Laden, okay? Arab, and what you've seen in the Arab uprisings of the last two years is many of these Arab leaders be thrown out of office. But there's still a lot of Arab monarchs like King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia who's still in power, right? But this big uprising on the Arab street is all about change and throwing out some of these old uh, corrupt political leaders and getting perhaps some sort of democracy. Or, 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 pay attention to this, this is going to be more important near the uh, middle of the semester, or maybe become Islamic republics like Iran. So most Arab leaders don't really like Iran because they're afraid of Iran exporting that style of government, that sort of revolution to their doors. Maybe I've hinted at it, but let me go ahead and reinforce it again right now. People like King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia really hate Aminadjad. Really don't like any of the Iranian leaders at all. Like hate. Many Arab leaders outright do not like the Iranians. Okay? And it's not because they're not Arab. It's because they have a theocracy. The Arab leaders are more scared of theocracy than they are the, the fact that they're Persian. Does that make sense? 
We'll, we'll elaborate in more detail about that later, but do know that for now. Most of these leaders that are lit up here absolutely hated all the Iranian leaders. Saddam Hussein actually went to war with them. And all the other Arab leaders were like, yay, do that, Saddam. You're crazy, go for it. That's great, blow them up. We don't like them. For its part, I think I want to go ahead and give it to you now, even though it makes more sense later. Saudi Arabia is arming itself to the teeth. Saudi Arabia has bought billions and billions of dollars of weapons from the United States in the last decade, preparing for some sort of eventual face-off with Iran. So while we hear in the press about Israel may do something to Iran, the United States hates Iran, it's actually many of these Arab countries that are like, oh, we're probably the ones who are going to fight Iran. Yes. The question is, why does the United States sell weaponry to Saudi Arabia when there are terrorist groups in Saudi Arabia? Who are we selling the weapons to? We're selling it to the government. Yeah. And when I say billions and billions, I mean like $50 billion worth of weapons. Tanks and jets and missiles and anti-missile shields and all kinds of stuff. Arming them to the teeth. Uh, even if we thought maybe they were going to terrorist groups, you also have to remember that which we don't, but you have to remember that arms sales are from private companies. The U.S. companies sell weapons, and money is money. And the United States is one of the biggest exporters of weapons on planet Earth, us and Russia, actually. We're really good at making stuff that kills people. We're awesome at it, okay? Okay, sorry to digress into Saudi Arabian and Iranian politics. Let's get back to the leaders real quick. Uh, in fact, we've already got through this one, too. Al-Assad is an Arab leader that, who's not well liked by other Arab leaders, so he may be gone soon too. Uh, now, speaking of who's really in charge, who's really in charge and of what country? Who are these dudes? That's right. The first one, well, actually, don't write that down because it's an old slide. He was President Medvedev, and this was a Prime Minister whip-ass, all right? <laughs> what, what leader of a country has a glamour shot? That's all I want to know. You, if, you have, if you're a male and you have glamour shots, you must be a badass. You have to be a badass to have that willingly put out. I'm the president of this country, look. I'm also a member of Hair Club for Men. I don't know if that's his real hair or not, but uh, this Dmitry Medvedev used to be the president, but everybody thought the whole time he was president that he actually was just a puppet of Putin who holds real power. Uh, this is a nice little political cartoon with his Putin with his Medvedev puppet. But of course, you know that that slide is outdated because they've swapped back, and now he's back to being President Whipass, and they uh, uh, swap back so he is Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. Okay, and we've already had a long discussion about the awesomeness that is Vladimir Putin, so we won't go any further into that right now. Uh, but let's go to another continent, actually. Who is the president of South Africa? The one on the left or right? Right. Now, you guys know that because hopefully most of you have read the textbook and you've also watched the video. Uh, when I would ask this class mostly over the course of the last decade, everybody would pick the other dude. Who's the other dude? It's not Morgan Freeman, all right? That's Nelson Mandela. He was the first black president of South Africa. And he's a living legend uh, because he spent most of his life in prison fighting against apartheid. And he's won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he's awesome. But he's old. He's like 110. He's not the president anymore. The new president of South Africa, current president of South Africa, is Jacob Zuma. And if you didn't know who Jacob Zuma was before this class, here's what he thinks of you, all right? <laughs> Zuma's kind of a badass in his own right, too, by the way. I think he has like 50 children and, and, and several wives slash ex-wives. And one of his campaigns, when he was running for office, you think, you think U.S. campaigns are bad? When this guy was running for political office, they made up a song, something about carrying a machete and chopping up his opponents to pieces at the polls. And so... He would carry the machete and dance around. He's like, yeah, we should have more of that in the United States. That's great. Let's involve weaponry in the debates. 
So Zuma is important to know, as is any leader of South Africa, because it is currently the richest economy of the African continent. And as I've pointed out, I believe before, the leader of South Africa typically is involved in virtually all African affairs. So if there's some sort of peace negotiation happening between Rwanda and the Congo, for whatever reason, the president of South Africa will typically be there to mediate, lend support to it, help out any way they can. They are a powerful figure within the African continent. That's changing a little bit because countries like Nigeria are getting richer and as powerful. But for right this second, South Africa is kind of the richest, most developed African state, and their leader is pretty important in world affairs. Okay? And that is Jacob Zuma. And forever shouted out at uh, Morgan Freeman. That was one of those uh, LOL things. If you don't know who Morgan Freeman is, I, I don't really see any similarities, but I guess because it's a black man with white hair that somehow they look alike. I, I don't see it at all, but. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember when Morgan Freeman was on this show called The Electric Company. Does anybody ever see The Electric Company on PBS? Go Google Easy Reader. He was called Easy Reader. He had this rap. This is back in the 70s. He was Easy Reader, Morgan Freeman. Uh, and you'll die laughing at that. Let's stay in Africa for a couple more. Which is the nice guy, the nice African guy in this picture? The guy on the right? Who's the guy on the right? Kofi Annan, who's the guy on the left? Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe, who's an international pariah who's pretty much self-isolated his country, very much like North Korea has, uh, because he, about a decade ago, when running for office, decided to run on a platform of kill all the whiteys in our country. Now, the reason he had this platform was to try to redistribute land and resources. And that's respectable. But when you have the president of a country who's basically green-lighting, killing your own citizens, it's not cool. It's just not cool. And so when he had did this a decade ago, most other countries are like, oh, you're crazy, and we're not doing business with you anymore until you stop doing that. And as people who are turning into dictators are wont to do, he said, hell no, it's my country, and I'll do any damn thing I want. He's been in power for about 33 years. Supposedly, it's a democracy, but he's won every single election for three decades. And he kind of controls all the levers of power, and he has no ambition to ever give up power until he's dead, period. He kind of has stated this. So most countries of the world have an embargo against Zimbabwe. It actually, at one point, was kind of a rich country doing pretty well. Now it has 300,000% inflation, which means a loaf of bread costs 10 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. So that's where their economy is today. But he's still in charge with an iron fist. So good for Robert Mugabe. The other dude, of course, you pointed out, is former, former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan. I was getting ready to chuck this slide out Oh, and by the way, here's proof in the pudding. Who else would Bono be hanging out with? Bono hanging out with Kofi. Uh, and I was going to chuck this slide, but Kofi Annan has actually been in the news recently. What was Kofi up to recently? Just this semester, actually. Kofi came out of retirement and was in charge of the peace process in Syria. They sent him in to say, hey, can you see if you can get the government to talk to the rebels and have a peace process in place. And he tried for about six months, and at the beginning of the semester, he was basically said, screw this, this shit's done. These people are going to kill each other, and there's nothing we can do, and I'm done. Which is funny, because that's what he was saying at the end of his term as UN Secretary General as well. So he's the former Secretary General who's in charge of the United Nations now. Our friend Ban Ki-moon. Ban Ki-moon. Where's Ban Ki-moon from? South Korea, South Korea. He is from South Korea, head of the United Nations. Uh, and he joins several other Asian leaders in the top slots of power in international organizations, which is one of the reasons why I keep saying, 
hey, we're kind of in an Asian century now. It's just not Asian countries, but Asians are rising to important positions all over the planet. Oh, and by the way, I did have to tell this story from just a couple months ago. Robert Mugabe celebrated his 88th birthday. Uh, and during the festi festivities, which I'm sure cost a million dollars in uh, Zimbabwe at the expense of the taxpayers, he said, uh, apparently I have died many times. I've beaten Jesus Christ because he only died once. And Jesus only was like 30 and I'm 88. And so I say, you're awesome. Happy birthday, Christ beater, all right? <laughs> He's, he's an odd bird. Don't look for him to depart anytime soon unless it's in a coffin when you make statements like that. Uh, which one of these people was not, repeat, not born in Germany? <laughs> Who are all these people? Okay, first off, which one's not German? Hitler. Hitler's not German? Where the hell's he from? He was Austrian. Then he went to Germany and took over, all right? So who are all the other people? Well, we'll start with this guy. Everybody knows Einstein. Einstein. He's German. Does anybody know? Heidi Klum, German supermodel, and Augustus Gloop, the fat kid on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Some of you really didn't know that? That's awesome. I was like, yeah. For the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, they actually went and got this kid who spoke no English whatsoever, they filmed it in Germany, and they just picked this kid off the street, and they're like, here, yeah, you're porky enough here. You're Augustus Gloop. If you ever go back and watch the film again, he speaks no English. They just taught him to say, like, one thing, I'm hungry. That's his whole line in the movie. Hungry. Now, he's German, too. But the one we want you to know, of course, is Angela Merkel. Looks like Angela, pronounced like Angela. Angela Merkel is the chancellor of Germany, the top slot, kind of like a president or prime minister. I'm not sure which one it's more like. I think it's more like a prime minister in terms of elections, but I'm not going to swear to that. She is, if you, have, if you don't know this already, jot it down, Angela Merkel is the most powerful woman on the planet. More powerful than two Oprahs, all right? Because Angela Merkel, of course, is heading up Germany, which is the fourth largest economy on planet Earth. I think I've already told you this. It's the powerhouse of Europe. All these other economies are getting smaller. Germany is still getting bigger. Probably 10 years from now, there'll be no other European economies in the top 10 or top 20 of the biggest economies in the world. Germany will still be at number four. No doubts about it. The reason she's also one of the most important and influential people on the planet is because of Germany's power within Europe. Germany can affect European Union policy more than any other country. Germany can affect European banking system more than any other country. What Angela Merkel wants, Europe will do. Europe will do it. They won't do it happily. They're not proud of the fact that Germany has so much power, but whoever is in charge of Germany has the most leverage, the most power to control policy for the entire European Union. That is saying something. Is she conservative, or is she conservative right or liberal left? She's conservative right. Please jot this down if you don't know this already. This is the woman who's been putting into place the austerity measures that all the European countries have to do. Now, I'm simplifying because that's what I do. They've got councils and banks and big meetings and people debating with each other. What I'm telling you, what Angela Merkel wants is what's going to happen. Okay? So she is the one who says, Jawohl! Germany is powerful, we're rich, and we're economically sound, and we're fiscally sound. You bozos in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, in the UK, you need to get on board our program. Austerity. Slash your spending, get your debt down, get back in line to grow the European economy. 
That's what Angela Merkel thinks, and that's what everybody's doing. With what exception? France. Ah, oh, the French got us again. Okay? So she is the purveyor of all this policy. She really commands what's going on. Again, that may be a little strong stated, but she is in commands, and if you have any trouble remembering her, just remember she'll send the U-boats out on you if she has to, to get her policy passed through, all right? Like we needed to see that, but maybe it'll help you remember, all right? Merkel, learn it, live it, love it, don't cross it, all right? Conservative right, fiscal conservative, also social conservative too, okay? Merkel. I also want you to know that of the biggest European powers, you now know that Germany is number one. Of the, of the powerhouses of Europe, Germany is the richest economy and will continue to be your whole life. They're an industrial powerhouse. Germany is one of those unique places that even though they're rich like the United States and as developed as the United States, they have service sector and banking and financial economies like the United States. But maybe jot this down, Germany somehow is special because it maintained its industrial core. Maintained its indu industry. So where the United States and rich countries, we typically are like, oh no, send those car making jobs somewhere else. Send all the jobs that make stuff, send those somewhere else. Send industries to China because it's cheaper labor. Germany has held on to their industrial core. It's one of the reasons why they're rich. Because what do you get from Germany? Cars like what? Like really good cars. Does anybody else know what comes out of Germany? We have good beer, yes. I don't know if they do any computers. They do computers? They're big into, uh, uh, anybody, uh, I think, is Bosch a German company? Bosch is a German company. What's the spark plug company? Motor parts, industrial parts, mining, drilling, any sort of industrial equipment, Germany makes it, and they make it the best. Their cars, the best. Their machines, the best. Can you get it cheaper in China? Yes, you can. Can you get it better? No. Put this in your brain. This is the kind of stuff I like people to know. The reason Germany is maintained its power and strength of economy is that industrial core. And they've been maintaining the core not by making it cheaper, but by having the highest quality that can't be faked in a Chinese sweatshop, period. So you can make a, a Bosch drill cheaper in China, but you can't make it better than you make it in Germany. You could, you could make a Mercedes in China, you won't make it better than they make it in Germany. And everybody knows that. Make sense? What do we make in America that's the best in the world? Guns? Did somebody say fat people? That's just cruel. That's just correct. I mean cruel. Not nice at all. Airplanes. Actually, we do. We do have some industrial sector still left. Engines? Entertainment, guns we got. Education? Let me just shout out for education. The best educational system in the world is in America. Feels like a midterm question, it's true. The best educational system in the world is in America. You're supposed to cheer because you're doing it right now. Forget it, forget it. You missed it, the magic's lost. I'm not kissing you again, yes. Why do other countries have higher literacy rates? Oh, let me, let me uh, amend my statement. I actually, I said it right the first time. We have the best higher education. We have the best higher ed system on the planet. The best higher ed system. Meaning, your, well, your degree from Virginia Tech, whatever it is in, especially if it's in science, math, or engineering, yeah, you will have, when you get that piece of paper, you have the gold standard in the world for degrees. And I'm not saying it's Virginia Tech, yeah, who gives you the best? I'm saying you're from a polytechnic institute in America. And that means gold, gold standard. 
They've got polytechnic institutes in Russia and China and Japan and Germany. Your degree is worth more than theirs. Everybody knows it too. Have you ever asked yourself or asked your fellow students, hey, you're from Germany or China, how come you're here studying? Why aren't you studying back at your university in your, in your country? It's better. Gold standard. But anyway, we're getting away from the, this is supposed to be a simple slide, now it's taking an hour. When we see these three together, know them as the EU3. By name, say them all together with me, by name, that is Holland and Merkel and Cameron of the UK. That is Europe's three biggest economies. They are the EU powerful three. Merkel has the most voice, but when they're crafting policy, the other two are at the table. So if these three can't agree on something, it's not going to happen within the greater European Union. They hold most of the levers of power behind the scenes, these three countries. Right? And again, Merkel's kind of the most powerful right now, but the other two are still pretty strong. Just looking at the size of the countries and the population and the economies, these three are like the superpowers of Europe put together. Okay? And that's why you'll often see them even over here on our side of the pond visiting with world leaders. These three will do things together when it's high profile. They represent Europe. All right. Uh, now it's time for a rapid fire round Asian persuasion. And I know you've already done this online, so this will be really fast. So let's wrap up this world leader stuff as quick as possible. Who is this? Yes, it is who. Hu Jintao of? Then who is this? Yoda of? That is Prime Minister Noda of Japan. And who is this? It's going to get you. Okay, you guys have been studying. That's Asif Zadari of Pakistan. Pakistan. And, of course, oh no, this is an outdated slide. Who is that? That was Kim Jong-il, but you remember how he used to dress? You ever see pictures of Kim Jong-il? He's always in that khaki jumpsuit. That's why I always think of him, not as Kim Jong-il, but as UPS Employee of the Month. <laughs> he, looked, he, he looked like a UPS delivery guy. But, of course, he's dead. So who took his place? <laughs> ah, Kim Jong-un. The un Kim is now in charge of North Korea. Uh, and, of course, in the middle, center square, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Prime Minister of India. And what was his specialty? I think I told you this last week. Finance. A finance wizard. Uh, India was doing really good for the last decade under his leadership, both as a finance minister and then as prime minister. It's actually kind of slacking off right now. I, I was going to show you this slide because it was a story from today. Maybe we'll make it a midterm question, just for fun. Manmohan Singh came out earlier today for whatever reason and kind of apologized to his country and said, yeah, sorry, we're not doing really good in science. That was it. That was the statement. I, do, I still I haven't read enough to know why he made this statement, but he essentially said, you know, we Indians, we have not really had any scientific innovations. Or, or scientific new stuff that we, you know, evolved out ourselves in our own labs. We're really weak in science. So a bizarre test question that only you will get if you're here and taking notes and remember it. Manmohan Singh thinks that India's weak in science. Uh, and he wants to fix that, perhaps. Don't know why, just occurred to me that he said it. Here's why these five people are important, though. It's just five dudes. Five dudes, four of them are declared nuclear powers, or at least something is going on in North Korea that they dance around and say, we've got nuclear something, we have a nuclear thing, you want to see it? And it's kind of like, no, no, keep your pants on, we don't want to see your nuclear thing. Whatever. <laughs> That's pretty much the world's opinion about North Korea's nuclear pro uh, program. We're like, we don't want to see it, we don't want to know. Just keep a lid on that, all right? Uh, but they are four nuclear powers and collectively, collectively, almost three billion people live in these countries. Think about that. Just five dudes. Five dudes who make policy. 
five dudes that may go to war with each other. Just five dudes have the highest positions of power in these countries that control three billion people. That's why it's important you know these heads of state, who they are and who they like and who they don't like and what's up. Whoever's in charge of the country is important. They shape policy, especially when it comes to war and crazy stuff like that. All right. Uh, now, I know Asian leaders can be tough, so here are some devices to help remember them. Manmohan Singh, does anybody know what religion he is? It's a Sikh. You will always see him with the blue term, the blue head wrap, always. It's a religious garb. You always have it on. I think maybe I've seen him in a black one once, but it's almost always the light blue one, okay? That's easy enough. Who's this guy in the middle? That's who? How do we distinguish him? He wears glasses. That's all I got, too, all right? It's the Chinese guy that wears glasses. I'm sure he's the only one out of 1.3 billion. Uh, who's this guy, though? <laughs> Dalai Lama. Is he Chinese? He's not Chinese. He does not play no joke. Uh, he always has got the saffron robes because he is the leader of Tibet, maybe? Um, what does Hu Jintao think about the Dalai Lama? <laughs> I don't know that Hu is threatening death. Okay, maybe he is, all right? But maybe not in public. Uh, yeah, uh, Hu and virtually all the Chinese government totally despises this guy, hates his guts. Why? What do they think he is? They, they think he's a rebel or a terrorist who's trying to pull Tibet away from China. So here we have China, who's willing perhaps to go to war over a group of rocks. How far do you think they're willing to go to hold on to Tibet, an area about the size of 10 Virginias? They're not letting that go anytime soon either. Okay, so they think this guy's a rabble-rouser, troublemaker, even though he's a monk, a holy man. Tibetan Buddhist, man, peace, chill, love, it's all good. Everyone else in the world loves him. The Chinese hate him. And it's not just the government. You should know the average Chinese citizen hates this guy's guts, too. In fact, can I get a shout-out from any Chinese citizens in here? Do you hate that guy? Yeah. Need say no more. Proof is in the pudding, all right? Crowdsourcing knowledge of hate right here live in world regions. And you can talk to Chinese people, and they'll say, yes, you, don't, you think he's a good guy. We'll tell you the real story of why he's a bad guy. And I encourage you to ask your fellow Chinese students. They can tell you better why they think that way than I can. All right, so those are some three easy ones, right? Uh, but there are other leaders that are a little tougher. This guy you don't need to know, he used to be in office. He's not in office anymore. His name was Nato Khan. And so I'm showing you this because I want help from you to help me be able to teach better. So he was in office last year. Write this down if you don't know it. Japan has gone through six prime ministers in the last six years. None of them last more than a year. The guy in charge right now is likely not to last the rest of the semester, okay? He was the guy in charge last year. And I just thought he looked like a pretty average Japanese guy, for all I know. But everybody in the class kept saying, oh, no, he's easy. We can identify him. And I'm like, but he doesn't have any distinctive traits. How can you identify him from the other Asian leaders? And people kept saying, mole, 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 mole. I never would have thought of it, but suddenly the Prime Minister of Japan was Mole Man, and everybody knew Mole Man, and everybody got it right on the test. So, in the spirit of that, I was looking at the current Prime Minister of Japan, and I think you all know where I'm going with this. Uh, his name is Yoshihiko Noda. Ah, Noda-san. Yoshihiko Noda. And again, not much distinctive, kind of a well-fed Japanese guy, I guess. I thought maybe a sumo wrestler. No, I can't really see. He's not big enough to be sumo. But his name is Yoshihiko Noda. If we were to abbreviate that, it would be just Y Noda. And why not abbreviate it more to just Yoda? And he kind of does look like Yoda. He kind of he does. A little bit, maybe. I don't know. Prime Minister of Japan I am. I don't know. And I don't, so would you rather a Noda, a Yoda, or a Hoda? I don't know. 
or, or uh, uh, perhaps Yoda on Hoda, or uh, 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 Noda as Yoda. No, I'm sorry, that's Hoda as Yoda. That actually is that lady, Hoda, dressed as Yoda. Uh, you, don't, you only need to know. <laughs> Bastard of the week for impersonating Yoda, all right? So you just need to know Prime Minister Noda. Hopefully that helps. And of course, the other Asian leader that's kind of new on the scene. Oh, by the way, look for Prime Minister Noda, as I've now suggested, to not be in office much longer. Uh, he's actually been in there over a year. He's outlasted everybody for the last seven years. So his time is coming quickly. Uh, the other major leader that shifted over, of course, is that Kim Jong-il died last year. And is everybody's saying, all, really? He was a dictator for like 20 years. Uh, and so he knew he was dying. Everybody must have known he was dying. Because just a couple months before he actually died, he suddenly picked up his second or third son out of a lineup and started giving him titles. That's how they do it in dictatorship dynasties. So they said, okay, come, son. No one in public has ever seen you before. You've never held a job besides maybe a hot dog eating contest, all right? <laughs> so now you're in charge of our Politburo. Can you pick Kim Jong-un out of the crowd of these people here? Yeah. He's the only one that definitely didn't miss the, the all-you-can-eat buffet before this picture was taken, all right? So he, he may be 26, 27, 28 years old. Nobody really knows. They can't confirm it. Nobody, know, nobody knows if he's ever had a job. No one knows if he had any education. They think maybe he went to a Swiss boarding school at one point. So uh, for better or worse, Daddy then did die two months later. And so uh, this guy... <laughs> Hold up the second chin there. I got it. I got it. Okay. This 27-year-old nobody who's never done anything is in charge of the fourth largest military on the planet that may or may not possess some sort of nuclear material. Good times. Good times. Um, we have no idea what his mentality is, what he may do, how he may act. And here's the kicker. Please remember this, jot it down if you got to. He's only 27 or 28 years old. He's a dictator. He's an automatic dictator. How long is he going to be around? Forever. He could live another 40 years easy. He needs to cut out the Twinkies maybe, but 40 years easy. This guy could be in charge of North Korea when you have grandkids. He could still be in charge unless something revolutionary happens, okay? So I think you already know the punchline here. Initially when I saw this guy, I'm like, who the hell is this guy? What, I, how am I supposed to remember this pudge? I mean, he looks really familiar to me. I looked and I'm like, you know, I saw something. I saw it. Yeah, that's it. It's a kid from Up. <laughs> Definitely. Maybe that's what he was doing behind the scenes, training to be the commander-in-chief of North Korea. And he probably was given all those badges just for cookie eating or something, all right? <laughs> so maybe that'll help you remember the Kim Jong-un or just little Kim, according to Time magazine. All right, uh, now as I've already suggested, Asian leaders abound, not just as heads of state of some of the most populous countries on the planet. And Asia is the happening part of the planet right now in terms of innovation and growth economically and technologically, even culturally. Think about this. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I want to tell you this. What's the hottest cultural thing in the United States right now? The hottest song right now? Gangnam Style. Where's it from? South Korea. South Korea. South Korea. Katie, was you the one that told me, isn't this the first time ever that a foreign song has topped the charts in the United States? Is that true? Does anybody know? Who? Beatles? Oh, they don't count the Beatles. Ah, uh, okay. The, the first time that an Asian song has topped the charts? Okay. Think about this. This is not a fluke. Let me repeat. Gungam Style, or whatever the hell the name of that song is. This is not a fluke. This is a sign of our times. It's a sign of our times. We hear that China, and I've told you a hundred times, yes, 
China's rich, so is South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, India. These are all growing economies. And they're the most populous countries on the planet. And they're big powers. But it's deeper than that. Now they're becoming centers of innovation of technology. And the space race that's happening right now is happening between Asian countries, not the Western ones. And yes, it's gone as deep as culture. A South Korean pop song is the number one song here? And for those of you that don't travel very much, I should also tip you off. Uh, my fashion peeps have alerted me to this, that Asian, South, South Korean, Japanese, and Chinese fashion has actually already been ahead of everybody for maybe a decade. That all the cool new fashion things you get here and you're like, oh, this is cool, look at this. They never made this before. And it's like, uh, yeah, they did in South Korea like five years ago. Every, everybody was already wearing those, okay? Much less Pokemon, all right? So think about all the Asian cultural stuff and all the other baggage that's now starting to not dominate the world, but it's trickling down that it's like, hey, they got stuff going on over there. Uh, and I did want you to know those other e Asian leaders, we already got Ban Ki-moon in charge of the UN, but this other guy in charge of the IAEA, what's his name? Okay, Yukio Amana, and the guy who's actually in charge of the World Bank right this second, he's Asian, but he's Asian American. He's a guy from America, but he's Asian American. I think he's first gener second generation Asian American. So in charge of the top tier of stuff across the planet, oh, I'm sorry, we'll get to it now, Here's this guy, and you definitely need to know him. Who is he and why is he of increasing importance in the world? And the tip was supposed to be that all of these leaders that I'm showing you around him are all what? They're all presidents, but they're all, I heard it, they're all nuclear. These are all the countries that have declared nuclear power, or uh, not power, nuclear weapons, with the exception of the kid from up who again may or may not have something, but we count them in this category. So these are all the countries that have nuclear weapons. So who's the guy in the middle and why is he important? If you don't know him yet, his name is Yukia Amana. And does anybody know where he's from? Mexico. Not Mexico. <laughs> Mexico? You're thinking of Felipe Calderon. He's actually from Japan. So get another high profile uh, Asian person in charge of a major organization. What's so important about his job? Who's doing the inspections on the Iranian nuclear facilities? This is the guy that will decide if the Iranians are breaking the rules on their nuclear energy industry. He's the guy that writes the paper that says, oh, by the way, I personally think that Iran is trying to develop a nuclear weapon. If he says that, that changes international policy overnight, just like that. They're the guys that inspect nuclear facilities all over the world, nuclear energy, but also nuclear weaponry. So it's a very important job, whoever's in charge of this place, because they will shape possibly war. If Yukio comes out tomorrow and says, I have proof that Iran has a nuclear weapon. If he says that, war's on the next day. So he has a very important role, as does any leader of the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency, listed right over his back shoulder right there, okay? Uh, now we'll get to know some Latin leftists, the Chavez chums, as I like to say. All these are pictures of Hugo Chavez with somebody. Uh, there is Fidel Castro. There's Hugo Chavez with Rafael Correa of Ecuador. I don't expect you to know that one for the test. That's... Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua. There's Hugo with, that's the one you should know, Dilma Rousseff of Brazil and Evo Morales of Bolivia. What's the common co commonality here? They're all from South America, Latin America. They're all leftists. We would say some of them hardcore socialists, some of them borderline socialists. They do favor left-leaning socialist economic policy in their countries. The one I want you to know for sure right now, Hugo Chavez, of course, who is the self-proclaimed leader of the socialist revolution. He gave the title to himself, all right? Uh, the person you really need to know, though, of course, is Dilma Rousseff. Now, if you know nothing else about leftist policy right this second, I do want you to jot down that Dilma is 
center left, maybe a little further left than that. So here's the center, center stage. Hugo Chavez is hardcore left, semi-communist left. Dilma Rousseff is about here, okay, in terms of using the government to redistribute wealth and provide social services and all this other stuff. Brazil is just slightly left, not hardcore left, right? Hugo, way left. Dilma, slightly left. And of course, Dilma's in charge of Brazil, uh, the powerhouse economy of Latin America. Borderline world power already. Okay? Definitely regional power. Dilma and Brazil see themselves as the natural leader of Latin America, much the way the United States sees itself as the leader of North America. Okay? And there's something to that. They're really happening. And if you didn't know who she was, that's what she thinks of you. All right? I know we're running out of time, so with some world leaders gone wild, who is this? Hillary Clinton. She is currently... Secretary of State. How much longer is she going to be Secretary of State? No, it does not depend on the election. How much longer is Hillary Clinton going to be Secretary of State of the United States? Less than a year. It's less than, it's less than two months. Know this. She has already said she is retiring after the election no matter who wins. No matter who wins. Okay? Are you clapping because you like her or hate her? I don't know. She said she's stepping down. Okay? What's that? Her hair is horrible, so she shouldn't be Secretary of State. You're a, you're a bad, bad man. You're going to get lynched, all right, by all the women. Uh, let's get on with the rest of the leaders, though. Who's that? Okay, there's Dilma again, Dilma Rousseff of Brazil. Who's that? Angela Merkel in the hizzle. And finally, a new one you haven't seen. Julia. Everybody knows her. Julia Gillard of Australia. Uh, she is the Prime Minister of Australia. These are the most powerful women in the world. Of course, Merkel is probably number one, but Hillary Clinton typically ranks dos. Okay? Uh, and Dilma's probably top ten as well. Right? And Australia is nothing to sneeze at. They have a top 20 economy as well. Pretty big economy, pretty big deal. Okay? Uh, finally, speaking of big rising economies, what do all these folks have in common? They're rich, all right? Let's go one at a time. What country is she in charge of? And he's in charge of? And he's in charge of? And finally, rich! And you put all the letters together, the B-R-I-C, they're in charge of the brick house, the fastest growing non-Western economies on the planet. Had you put your money in all these countries 10 years ago, you'd be rich right now too. If you kept all your investments in Western Europe and America, you'd be poor like we are. All of these countries have gone up in value and growth across all industries. Now I know there's a lot of people filtering in. We still have 12 minutes of lecture left, so you can filter in and find a seat, but please do it as quietly as possible. Still have a few more slides because some of these are actually going to be questions that I'm getting ready to give you in 12 minutes. So stay, stay with us. Do what? Everybody good? So everybody, there's plenty of seats down front, so come in, but please do keep it down. We'll try to get through this as painlessly as possible. Let's do a quick round of this because this will be a test question in 10 minutes. So I'm going to go through these one at a time and you yell out extremely loudly, loves the U.S. or hates the U.S. You ready? I'll say the name, you say love or hate. Ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's start up top. Hugo Chavez. Hey. He does not like the United States. He thinks we're imperialist, capitalist pigs crushing down the Latin Americans with our steel boot. How about Erdogan? Oh. Loves the U.S., although he has issues with the freedom of speech thing right now. And he, of course, is prime minister of? Turkey, let's go to Ayatollah Khomeini. Hates the United States. Source of all evil on the planet, United States. How about King Abdullah? Loves the U.S. Saudi Arabia, huge ally of the United States, and now you know recipient of billions and billions of U.S. weapons, or billions of dollars worth of U.S. weapons. Let's go to Yoda. Loves the U.S. In fact, think about it, midterm exam question. What 
do you think any Japanese prime minister would be doing towards the United States right about now, given current events? Kissing our ass, almost 20 people said simultaneously. That is truth. Truth. Because actually Yoda's a center-left guy who has actually wanted to break away from U.S. foreign policy a little bit. I can assure you he's over that right now. Over it. Let's now go to Unkim. Hates, but we don't know. We just assume because North Korea thinks that, again, the United States is the antichrist slash the anti unkim since he is Christ in their culture. How about Francois Holland? It doesn't matter. Wow. Uh, yeah, likes. A strong like. Don't believe the hype, even though we love to make fun of the French, and the French love to make fun of us. They're on Team West. They're a NATO member. They're a U.S. ally. They fight with us. Okay, that's a strong term. They hang out with us when we get in wars and supply fondue to wounded soldiers. Whatever it is they do, they help out. So no matter who's in charge of France, they may say the bad things about the U.S., but they're a U.S. ally. Let's now go down under to Julia Gillard. Loves the U.S. If you didn't know this already, I can't remember if I mentioned it, but write it down. Julia Gillard is overseeing the first installations of what in Australia? U.S. military bases. U.S. active military bases going into northern Australia. First time ever. Ever. That is a trend that's just now starting it will last the rest of your life. So Julia, huge fan of the United States. And finally, David Cameron. Yeah, 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 he loves the United States. The US and Great Britain have a special relationship, which under some circumstances sounds a little seedy, but they actually say in public, we have a special relationship, all right? Now, which one of these men will the FBI shoot on site because he is the number one on the FBI's most wanted list. I don't know. I don't know. I made this slide over a decade ago. I made this slide over, actually, I made this slide 12 years ago to teach people who Osama bin Laden was. That's how cool I am. Nobody knew he was number one on the FBI's most wanted list before 9-11. Before. Everybody knew who this guy was, uh, but I have to update the slide because, of course, he's dead. Thanks, Obama. Uh, and he's dead. Thanks, George Bush. And we're waiting for him to die, thanks to nobody, all right? Castro up top. Uh, and, of course, that's Ricky Martin. I don't know if he's alive or not. Now, <laughs> what was the answer back then? And if all these people were alive, what would be the answer today? Osama was the answer. Why was it not the other ones? Most countries, including the United States, do not actively target a sitting head of state. We may declare war on your country, but up to that point, we don't go assassinate other world leaders, even if we hate them. Now, we bend the rules on that a lot, uh, but... That has been the U.S. policy, so only Osama was ever on the FBI's most wanted list. Uh, now we have seven minutes before our exam. Time for some LOL fun. Hopefully you know enough of these people so that you actually get the jokes you're getting ready to see. And indeed, maybe some of them will pop up on the screen or, uh, during the exam. So for those of you sitting in the doorways, come find a seat while we all guess the world leaders that we're seeing. Starting, yeah. Oh, and can I get our world uh, uh, leader, I'm sorry, world regions ushers to come up on stage? Over? The eight, I'm sorry, the eight who signed up or who already heard from Jen. Just come up on stage here. And let's get to some fun. The guy on the left you don't know, right? You don't know the guy on the left. It's a, it's a joke bomb, it's a joke grenade. You have to think about it for a second. Whose funeral is this, and who's the guy saying, I haven't decided yet? 
Vladimir Putin, President of Russia. Uh, and that, that guy who forgot it's Casual Friday is Dmitry Medvedev. He is the Prime Minister of Russia. Oh my gosh, anybody ever see this when this came out? Wow. Offensive! Offensive! I will say this for the record before I even saw this slide. Natalie Portman is my favorite actor ever. If only for the Natalie Portman rap. I don't even care about the slide. Natalie Portman rap is the greatest piece of music ever created. Uh, oh, that's just, no, no. Who are the people in question here? Angela Merkel, and who's checking it out? David Cameron, come on now, David, you're married. Uh, this, one's, <laughs> this one says, when socialist art attacks, for those that can't read it in the back of the room. It's just a great picture, and who's that getting attacked? Chavez. Hugo, Hugo Chavez being attacked. Uh, our world leaders toasting are Angela Merkel and back to Dmitry Medvedev who apparently wears the same suit every day of his life <laughs> and never knows it's casual Friday. Oh, this guy's already dead. Well, I should have taken this one out. For those of you that can't read it, it says, after defeating the sofa in combat, Gaddafi made a sash from its pelt. Uh, he is the former leader of Libya and currently residing somewhere in hell. All right? Let's see if I can read this one. I can't even read it. I must keep smiling. Uh, who are the people in question here? Queen Elizabeth, and behind her is our good friend Robert Mugabe, who looks like he's getting ready to take a bite out of the back of her head. Uh, <laughs> Chinese people can boo if you like. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. You stay classy, Tibet. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Of course, it's Angela Merkel in the locker room after a soccer game, just chilling out with people. That's how powerful she is. I heard there was some towel snapping after this picture was taken. Uh, Tater's going to Tate. For those of you that don't get the joke, uh, all four of these, this picture was taken about six months before the Arab Spring, uh, and they, all four of these people were the first four taken out by the Arab revolutions. All of them are all now thrown out of office or dead, and or dead or and in hell. Uh, ah, ah. Uh, who's this? Castro, who won't die no matter what happens. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, we thought you were Jody Foster. Oh, sad face for who? Julia Gillard, accidentally mistaken for Jody Foster, and then told to go home by who? David Cameron. Uh, the caption says, <laughs> the caption says, super glue, be careful with it. This is uh, the many, many uh, business suits of Angela Merkel in her favorite pose. If you ever see her, she's giving you the shout out symbol with that one. Oh. Who is the world leader? Stephen Harper. Stephen Harper. Getting some kittens. All right, and <laughs> dude, that shit is wicked looking picture. <laughs> and the cap the caption reads, "Excuse me, there's something wrong with my banana." Sorry. <laughs> and of course, that is the former Kim Jong Il. Uh, these faces are in order, but in order of what? 
Uh, skin color, what? <laughs> no, no. No, because she's way wider. She would go over here. Wow, again, my favorite class ever. I, for that comment, I'm giving everybody a bonus point on this world leaders exam that we're going to get to right now. The real answer is, of course, these are the six biggest economies. But dig this, possible midterm exam question, replacement. Brazil just bumped the UK. Sorry, tea sippers, you're out of the top six. But with that,